June 1, 1948, Denton, Texas. 21-year-old Virginia Carpenter takes a train trip from her hometown of Texarkana to enroll at the Texas State College for Women. That evening, Virginia is dropped off at her dorm by a cab driver, who claims he last saw her speaking with two unidentified males. Virginia is never seen again, and it would be three days before she is reported missing. There are numerous theories about Virginia's disappearance, including that the cab driver himself was responsible, or that she was a victim of the infamous Texarkana Phantom Killer, but there are no answers about what actually happened to her. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to our latest episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder, and today we are going to be jumping back several decades to cover a mystery which has gone unsolved for nearly 70 years, the 1948 disappearance of Virginia Carpenter. This is yet another example of a case which I've decided to cover because it is loosely tied to a listener suggestion. I've had multiple listeners request that I cover the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, which involves the 1946 slayings of several people by an unidentified serial killer nicknamed the Phantom Killer. While that case has already been covered on multiple true crime podcasts, such as Thinking Sideways and True Crime Garage, so I thought I'd try something a little different and examine the lesser-known mystery of Virginia Carpenter, a Texarkana resident who went missing after traveling to the city of Denton just two years after the Moonlight Murders. Since Virginia personally knew some of the victims of these murders, there has been speculation that these two cases might be connected. But we'll delve into that momentarily. I previously featured this case in an article I wrote for Lispers.com titled 10 People Who Mysteriously Vanished While Traveling, which was originally published in August of 2014. But before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes like this one and shorter minisodes. We deliver either a new full-length episode or a new minisode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it and leave us a rating or a review at any of those sites because that will help us garner more exposure. The Trail Went Cold also has its own PayPal account and a donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who's feeling generous and wants to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it and we'll be sure to give you a shout out on a future episode. So without any further ado, let us now examine the mysterious disappearance of Virginia Carpenter. Our story begins in Texas in 1948. Our central figure is 21-year-old Mary Virginia Carpenter, who goes by the name Virginia. She lives in Texarkana, a town which is located on the Texas-Arkansas border and occupies both states. Virginia hails from the Texas side of the city and lives with her mother, as her father passed away when she was 15 and she is the only child in the family. Virginia has made plans to enroll in a summer course at the Texas State College for Women, known as TSCW for short. Virginia had actually enrolled at the college two and a half years earlier, but had to drop out to return home and take care of her mother after she was stricken with an illness. She wants to become a lab technician and needs to take one summer course at TSCW in order to begin technician training in the fall. TSCW is located in Denton, which is around 200 miles away from Texarkana. Virginia's mother, Hazel Carpenter, wanted to drive her daughter to the campus, but Virginia insisted that she would be fine making the trip alone by train. So on the afternoon of June 1st, Virginia's mother dropped her off at the station, where she hopped on a train for the six-hour journey to Denton. Virginia had some luggage and a handbag with her, but carried most of her possessions in a black steamer trunk, which she checked in at Texarkana and would be delivered to her at the station in Denton when she arrived. During the trip, Virginia befriended a middle-aged school teacher on the train named Marjorie Webster, who also hailed from Texarkana and was planning to enroll in summer courses at TSCW. The train arrived in Denton at approximately 9 p.m., and Virginia and Marjorie agreed to share a taxi, so they hailed a cab driven by a man named Edgar Ray Zachary, who usually went by the name Jack. Zachary drove them both to the TSCW campus, but as they arrived, Virginia suddenly realized that she had forgotten to pick up her steamer trunk and asked Zachary if he would drive her back to the train station. Marjorie asked Virginia if she would like her to come along, but Virginia said she would be okay, so Marjorie was dropped off. After Virginia was taken back to the train station, she went inside to check on her trunk and was told it hadn't arrived yet. When Virginia returned to the taxi and explained her situation, Zachary offered to pick up the trunk and deliver it to her the following morning. Virginia agreed to this arrangement and gave him the trunk's claim ticket signing her name and the room number from her dormitory on the back, which authorized Zachary to pick it up for her. She also gave him a $1 tip for his trouble before Zachary drove her back to the campus. According to Zachary, they arrived back there at around 9.30, and he dropped Virginia at her dormitory, Brackenridge Hall. When Virginia exited the cab, 
Zachary claimed he saw her walk over to two young men standing next to a cream-colored convertible parked outside the dorm. Virginia apparently said, What are you doing here? Acting like she knew the two men, but was surprised to see them. Virginia then told Zachary to leave her luggage on the front lawn because the two men would help her with it, and that he could also leave her trunk in the same spot when he returned the next morning. So Zachary took the luggage out of the cab and drove off, but this would turn out to be the last known sighting of Virginia Carpenter. Anyway, the following morning, Zachary went to the train station and used the claim ticket to retrieve Virginia's trunk. He then returned to Brackenridge Hall and left the trunk on the front lawn, as Virginia had apparently instructed. And believe it or not, that trunk would remain there unclaimed for two straight days before someone finally decided to take it to the dorm's main office. Curiously, Virginia's luggage, which Zachary had taken out of the cab and left on the lawn for her, was never found. On June 4th, three days after Virginia arrived in Denton, her boyfriend called Hazel Carpenter and told her that he had not heard from Virginia and could not get hold of her. Hazel became concerned and called TSCW and was surprised to learn that Virginia had not actually registered for her course yet, which she was supposed to do the morning after she arrived. After contacting all of Virginia's friends and relatives and finding no one who had heard from her, Hazel finally decided to call the Denton police and reported her daughter missing. A search of Denton and the surrounding area failed to turn up any trace of Virginia, and it eventually expanded into a statewide search with a reward being offered for information. Police eventually tracked down Jack Zachary, who shared his story about dropping Virginia off and retrieving her steamer trunk from the train station. The trunk was searched, but it provided no potential clues about Virginia's whereabouts. Investigators also looked into Zachary's story about Virginia meeting up with the two unidentified young men standing next to a cream-colored convertible. Well, this part of the story checked out, as there was a yellow convertible parked next to Brackenridge Hall that night. However, the vehicle actually belonged to a young man from the town of Grand Prairie, whose girlfriend was a TSCW student, which is why they were parked there together. The couple did remember two young men walking around outside the convertible that night, so it's possible that Zachary saw them and mistakenly assumed the convertible was theirs. Unfortunately, since it was dark and the lighting was poor, Zachary did not get a good look at the two men and only remembered that one was tall and the other was short and stocky. The couple in the convertible also didn't get a good look at the two men or recall anything about their conversation with Virginia. Now, there were parts of Zachary's story which seemed pretty strange, particularly how Virginia asked him to just leave her trunk on the front lawn outside the dormitory. The dean at the college claimed that this was the first time she'd ever seen someone's luggage just get dropped off outside the dorm. It was standard practice to deliver it directly to someone's room, and Zachary even had Virginia's room number on the back of her claim ticket, so why wouldn't he have given it directly to her? All that being said, there didn't seem to be much reason to question Zachary's story. As far as I can tell, an employee from the train station did verify that Virginia had been there inquiring about her trunk that night, and she was told it hadn't arrived yet. Zachary did hand in a claim ticket with Virginia's signature on it to pick up the trunk and drop it off outside the dorm. Police searched Zachary's cab for evidence and examined him for bruises and scratches, but found nothing. He was questioned extensively by police and managed to pass a total of seven polygraph tests. The cab company verified that Zachary called them to check in shortly after he dropped Virginia off and said that he was making no more pickups that night. And most importantly, Zachary's wife provided him with an alibi, telling police that he arrived home at 10 o'clock that night. So on the surface, Zachary did not seem like a probable suspect, but we'll get back to him in a little while. I know I must sound like a broken record saying this, but like many other missing persons cases I've covered on this podcast, the police looked at the possibility that Virginia ran away on her own. Of course, her mother did not believe that, but what's interesting here is that more than one of Virginia's former boyfriends said she was impulsive and had a tendency to become romantically infatuated very easily. In 1946, Virginia had gotten engaged to a student from Texas A&M University, but just three weeks before they were set to be married, Virginia broke things off, apparently because she realized their personalities just did not mesh. Virginia had a new boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, but there was kind of an odd incident shortly before she went missing. Virginia was finishing up some courses at Texarkana Junior College, and after spending the day at their annual picnic, Virginia fainted when she got home and was diagnosed with second-degree sunburn. Her doctor recommended that she rest for a few days, but Virginia still had to return to school to take her final exams before she made a full recovery. While there, Virginia apparently told one of her teachers about a love affair which did not work out and how she'd fallen in love with this boy again, but he did not love her back. I'm not entirely sure what Virginia was referring to here. Was she talking about her former fiancé, or did she have an affair nobody knew about? Or had Virginia's bout of sunstroke made her a bit delirious? No one knows, but that statement might have given off the impression that Virginia had become infatuated with a secret lover and ran off with him. Well, Hazel Carpenter felt there was no way her daughter would just disappear without telling her, and other than that strange statement, there was no evidence that Virginia was involved with another man. Investigators did look into the possibility that Virginia's current boyfriend was one of the young men seen with her outside the dorm, but he was interviewed dozens of times, passed a polygraph, and had an alibi placing him in Dallas that night, so he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. The other thing which seemed to give credence to the idea that Virginia ran away voluntarily was that there were a lot of sightings of her after she went missing. Of course, in every missing persons case, there's going to be a ton of sightings of the victim which turn out to be false, but a few of them stood out here. Two days after Virginia's disappearance, 
A gas station attendant thought he saw her in the town of Aubrey, which is located 10 miles away from Denton. What's interesting here is that the woman resembling Virginia was in a yellow convertible with Arkansas plates alongside two young men and another young woman. On the evening of June 11th, the ticket agent saw a young woman resembling Virginia at a bus station in Dequeen, Arkansas. She had just gotten off a bus from Texarkana and apparently looked a bit nervous. She then left the station with a man who appeared to be in his mid-twenties. The strangest detail here is that shortly after they left, the ticket agent received a phone call from a woman asking if a Miss Virginia Carpenter was there. And on January 14th, 1949, the Houston Press received a letter signed by a Mrs. Gladys Bass from Chirino, Texas, who claimed that she and her friends had recently picked up a young female hitchhiker who said her name was Virginia. The woman said she had no money and had run away, so Mrs. Bass and her friends bought her a meal. When Mrs. Bass later learned about Virginia Carpenter's case, she became convinced the female hitchhiker was her. And here's an amusing story. A few weeks after the disappearance, a hotel clerk in Jackson, Mississippi reported seeing Virginia check in there with an older man. The police soon went to the room and arrested the man inside, who turned out to be the famous actor Lash LaRue, who starred in a bunch of westerns during this time period. Well, it turned out that the woman believed to be Virginia Carpenter was actually Lash LaRue's wife, so the whole thing was just a big wacky misunderstanding. There were also rumors that Virginia had been sold into a white slavery ring, which is a theory you frequently hear these days whenever a young woman goes missing. But law enforcement didn't really have much of an understanding about white slavery at that time. Nevertheless, they didn't uncover any evidence to support this theory. Hazel Carpenter also started expressing hope that her daughter had somehow developed amnesia and was wandering around out there without knowing who she was. But again, no evidence was found to support this. Anyway, the investigation didn't uncover any solid leads for the next several years, so in 1955, Virginia was legally declared dead. But there would soon be some more interesting developments, one of which involved the cab driver Jack Zachary. It turned out that Zachary already had a criminal history before his encounter with Virginia Carpenter, with such offenses as petty theft and bootlegging. Shortly after the disappearance, Zachary was charged with assaulting a private investigator. He claimed the PI was hoping to collect on the reward offering in the case and was constantly hounding him, so Zachary was ultimately acquitted at his trial. But things got more serious in 1957 when Zachary was charged with the attempted rape of a woman. The victim, a 25-year-old mother of three, claimed that Zachary had been giving her a ride when he pulled over onto a secluded road, beat her, and then tried to sexually assault her. However, the charges were soon dropped when the victim asked the police not to prosecute. While Zachary was known for being abusive towards his wife and children, and by 1957, his wife had left him and gotten married to someone else. After learning about the attempted rape charge, Zachary's wife decided to come forward to the police and shared a surprising revelation. Even though she had initially provided her husband with an alibi and told police that he got home at 10 p.m. on the night of Virginia's disappearance, the former Mrs. Zachary now claimed that she had lied and that he actually returned home sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. And here's another bizarre detail she provided. After Virginia's disappearance, the Zacharys moved to the city of Midland. Every year on June 1st, the Denton Record Chronicle would publish an anniversary article about the case, and according to Zachary's wife, he would make a special trip to Denton just to purchase a copy of the paper, which, if true, is pretty crazy, because Denton is nearly a five-hour drive from Midland. Anyway, in spite of his ex-wife's claims, there was never any hard evidence to connect Zachary with Virginia's disappearance, and he died in 1984. The case made an unexpected return to the spotlight again in May of 1988, when an elderly man came forward and told police that Virginia had been murdered and her remains were buried in a dam at a stock tank located on the grounds of the Texas State College for Women, which by this point had been renamed Texas Women's University. This informant claimed that two men were responsible for Virginia's murder, but both of them were deceased by this point. The police did excavate the area of the campus where Virginia was supposedly buried, but all they found was a leather glove, rubber boot, and animal bone fragments. And after this, there really haven't been any major developments in the case. Hazel Carpenter passed away in 1980 and never learned what happened to her daughter but Virginia still has surviving relatives who are hoping to uncover the truth someday. It continues to remain one of Texas's most baffling missing persons cases. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So before I provide a full analysis of Virginia Carpenter's disappearance, I should give a brief synopsis of the Texarkana Moonlight Murders case and its possible connection to this. Like I said earlier, Virginia lived in Texarkana, which was the site of one of the most infamous unsolved serial killings ever just two years earlier. From February until May of 1946, Texarkana was terrorized by a psycho known as the Phantom Killer. Over the course of ten weeks, this unidentified man attacked four different couples from the area. The first couple, Jimmy Hollis and Marianne LeRae, were in a lover's lane area and forced out of their car by a man carrying a gun. Hollis was severely beaten with a blunt object, and LeRae was sexually assaulted, but they both survived. The victims described their assailant as wearing what appeared to be a white burlap sack with eye slits over his head. Within the next two months, two more young couples, Richard Griffin and Pollyanne Moore, and Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker, were shot to death in secluded areas near their vehicles. In both cases, the female was sexually assaulted. On May 3rd, a man named Virgil Starks was shot to death through the window of his farmhouse. The killer also shot Virgil's wife Katie Starks twice in the face, but she managed to flee the scene and survive. 
The media dubbed the crime spree the Moonlight Murders, even though the crimes did not actually take place when there was a full moon, and since the assailant just seemed to vanish after committing all these crimes, he was nicknamed the Phantom Killer. Needless to say, this sent Texarkana into a panic, and there was a massive investigation, but no one was ever charged with these crimes or conclusively identified as the Phantom Killer. The most promising suspect was a career criminal named Uel Swinney, as there was compelling circumstantial evidence against him, but nowhere near enough to charge him. Swinney went to prison for auto theft in 1947 and was never officially tied to the murders. Anyway, there are plenty of other podcasts and resources out there where you can learn more about the Texarkana Moonlight murders, so I highly recommend you go digging. So could the Phantom Killer be connected to Virginia Carpenter's disappearance? Interestingly enough, the beginning of his murder spree pretty much coincided with when Virginia was forced to drop out of TSCW and return home to Texarkana to take care of her sick mother. And Virginia apparently knew three of the victims, though I couldn't find any sources that specified which ones. These connections have led to speculation that perhaps the Phantom Killer decided to follow Virginia to Denton two years later and murdered her, but I really don't buy it. First of all, this theory is completely negated if Uel Swinney was the Phantom Killer, because he was already in prison for another crime by this time. And even if Swinney wasn't the killer, this theory still doesn't make much sense. Texarkana did not exactly have a large population at this time, and Virginia was in the same age range as many of the victims, so I don't think it's a particularly unusual coincidence that she would have known three of them. I just don't see why a serial killer would go on a murder spree for 10 weeks, stop for two years, and then follow one of Texarkana's residents nearly 200 miles to a different city to murder her there. Granted, if Jack Zachary's story is accurate, Virginia met up with two young men in front of the dormitory at TSCW and asked what are you doing here, so it is possible that someone did follow her all the way from Texarkana. But if that's the case, I don't believe that person was the Phantom Killer. He seemed to have an MO for targeting couples, and I don't see anything in his profile to suggest he would fixate on an individual female victim and go to such lengths to pursue them to another town. So I think the connection to the Texarkana Moonlight Murders is nothing more than a coincidence, but trying to figure out what actually did happen to Virginia Carpenter might be a little complicated. Now, the big issue with figuring things out is the uncertainty about whether or not Jack Zachary's story is true. There's a book out there titled In the Line of Duty, Reflections of a Texas Ranger Private, written by a former Texas Ranger named Louis Rigler, who investigated this case and devoted an entire chapter to it. He personally questioned Jack Zachary and concluded that he probably wasn't involved because he passed all those polygraph tests. Of course, nowadays, we all know how unreliable polygraph tests can be, which is why the results are always inadmissible in court and should never be used as a determining factor in a suspect's guilt or innocence. But in 1948, I don't think there was a very deep understanding about the usefulness of polygraphs. In fact, the machine used to test Zachary was one of only two existing polygraph machines in the entire state of Texas at that time. While it is possible for a guilty person to pass a polygraph test, I find it interesting that Zachary was able to pass seven of them. I've never heard of a suspect being polygraphed seven times, but Zachary would probably have to be one hell of a convincing liar if he was guilty. The fact of the matter is that Zachary was always cooperative with investigators, his story did stand up under scrutiny, and they never uncovered any evidence against him. Hell, Louis Regler admitted to having a fondness for the guy, and even testified on Zachary's behalf when he went on trial for assaulting the private investigator. It's clear that Zachary was not a good guy overall, as he definitely had a history of criminal activity, and I have no reason to doubt that he was abusive towards his family, or that the attempted rape he was charged for actually happened. But I'm not sure we'd have any reason to still consider him a suspect if his ex-wife hadn't come forward and claimed that she lied about his alibi on the night of the disappearance. I guess it's possible that Zachary's wife could have been lying when she came forward. She might have decided to do so after learning that Zachary had been charged with attempted rape, but that the charges would be dropped. This could have inspired her to concoct a story about a false alibi in hopes of getting him into trouble. But then again, if she was lying, why wouldn't she make up a more incriminating story, like claiming her ex-husband had flat out confessed to her that he murdered Virginia? I guess it's possible that after Virginia gave Zachary the claim ticket for the trunk, he took her somewhere to rape and murder her, and then checked in with the cab company to say he was making no more pickups that night in order to give him time to dispose of her body. He doesn't get home until 2 or 3 a.m., but then orders his wife to tell the police that he was there at 10 p.m. In order to cover his tracks, Zachary still goes through with picking up Virginia's steamer trunk and bringing it to the dorm that morning. The reason he just leaves it outside, rather than deliver it to Virginia herself, is because he knows she won't be there. I think one of the biggest unanswered questions is Virginia's luggage, which Zachary supposedly took out of his cab and left on the front lawn. We know that Virginia never checked into her dorm room and left her luggage there, so what actually happened to it? If Virginia was abducted after Zachary left, would the perpetrators have bothered to pick up her luggage and take it with them? However, the one detail which does add credibility to Zachary's story is his description of the cream-colored convertible and the two young men standing near it, as the owner of a yellow convertible did confirm that he was parked there that night. I guess it's possible that Zachary could have seen the convertible the first time he drove to the campus and dropped off Marjorie Webster, so maybe he remembered this detail and decided to add it to his cover story to make it sound more convincing. But I don't know, Zachary was an uneducated man, and it doesn't sound like he was some brilliant criminal mastermind. If he killed Virginia, it's hard to imagine him fabricating a very elaborate and detailed cover story to fool the police. So let's look at some other scenarios and the possibility that Virginia might have run off on her own. 
How reliable were these alleged eyewitness sightings of her? Well, I would probably discount the sighting of Virginia inside the yellow convertible with the two men and another woman at the gas station in Aubrey two days later. Like I said earlier, investigators tracked down the owner of the yellow convertible seen on campus, and he and his girlfriend were both ruled out as suspects. I'm inclined to think that the gas station attendant was mistaken, and just happened to see another young woman in a different convertible. Now let's talk about the eyewitness Gladys Bass, who claims she picked up a female hitchhiker who called herself Virginia. I have no reason to believe her story isn't true, but I'm inclined to think she probably picked up another young woman. It sounds like Mrs. Bass and her friends only came to the conclusion it was Virginia Carpenter when they saw a photo of Virginia after the fact. I've seen multiple cases on unsolved mysteries where a truck driver or a motorist gave a ride to someone, saw a missing persons flyer sometime after they parted ways, convinced that their passenger was the missing victim. But then it turned out the victim was dead all along, meaning that the eyewitness was mistaken and had actually given a ride to someone else. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case with Mrs. Bass and the hitchhiker. However, the alleged sighting of Virginia at the bus station in Dequeen, Arkansas? That one's pretty interesting. Because the young woman got off a bus from Texarkana, and the ticket agent took a phone call from someone asking for a Miss Virginia Carpenter. When you put all these things together, it would be one hell of a coincidence if the woman was in Virginia. I guess it's possible that the ticket agent was just a complete liar. She could have read about Virginia's story in the paper and used some key details to fabricate a story. If this woman was Virginia, it seems pretty weird that she would be getting off a bus which arrived from Texarkana. Would Virginia travel from Denton back to her hometown and then hop on a bus to the Queen to meet up with some guy 10 days after she went missing? And who was this female caller asking for Virginia? How would she know Virginia would even be at this particular bus station at that time? I don't know, something just doesn't add up here, but I guess there's no way to prove that the ticket agent was lying. One of the main reasons Hazel Carpenter did not believe her daughter ran away was because Virginia apparently only had $15 to $20 on her at the time. But what would be the logic of shipping a steamer trunk with a lot of your personal possessions to Denton, paying a cab driver to pick it up for you, and then just taking off before you even got the trunk back? The one detail I've always wanted more information about is when Virginia attended her final exams and allegedly told one of her teachers about this affair she had and how she'd fallen in love with a boy who didn't love her back. The only source which mentions this story is an article from the Denton Record Chronicle in 1950, but I've never been able to learn anything else. It doesn't sound like Virginia would have been referring to her current boyfriend, so was she having an affair behind his back? Did she run off to meet the secret lover of hers? Could he have been the man she was seen with at the bus station in Queen? I guess it's possible, but it seems like quite a stretch. So let's assume that Jack Zachary is telling the 100% truth, and that he really did see Virginia approaching two young men standing near a convertible. And assuming this convertible did not belong to them, and isn't connected to the case at all, who were these two young men? Virginia apparently said, what are you doing here, when she approached them, giving off the impression that she knew at least one of the men. Well, we know it wasn't her boyfriend because he had an alibi placing him in Dallas that night. On the surface, it might seem like Virginia knew these guys from Texarkana, and that they traveled all the way from there to meet her. But remember, Virginia had previously attended Texas State College for Women from September 1945 until February of 1946, before she had to drop out and return home. So it's possible that Virginia might have bumped into someone she'd known from her prior tenure at TSCW. And also, if you put any stock into Virginia's story about this affair of hers, maybe one of those guys was her secret lover, possibly someone she had an affair with the last time she was in Denton. Virginia might have acted surprised to see him there because, in her own words, she'd fallen in love again, but the boy did not love her. However, if this guy was Virginia's lover, I'm not sure why he'd come to see her with a male companion. Now the major wild card is the man who came forward in 1998 and claimed that two men had murdered Virginia and disposed of her body in a dam at a stock tank near the college. I know the authorities never found any evidence to back up his story, but if this witness was telling the truth, it would fit together with the facts. It's not implausible that those two men seen with Virginia could have abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered her, and then disposed of her body in a location which was close to the campus. The big problem, of course, was that the two suspects were already deceased by 1998, so they couldn't be named publicly unless there was corroborating evidence to support the witness's story. So there's no way of knowing if either of these men had a personal connection with Virginia or a motive to kill her. Hell, for all we know, one of the suspects could have been Jack Zachary since he was deceased at the time, though I'm not sure if he would have had an accomplice. Even though this lead didn't go anywhere, police haven't given much indication if they still believe the witness's story to be credible. I also don't know how this man would have found out the two suspects were responsible for Virginia's disappearance, but I guess it's possible they confessed about the murder to him, but were either lying or provided the wrong location of Virginia's body. So what really happened to Virginia Carpenter? Well, sadly, I can't really say with 100% certainty, and I am kind of stumped here, but I find it unlikely that Virginia just ran off, and I don't think she was a victim of the Texarkana Phantom Killer. The two most probable theories are that either Jack Zachary was responsible, or it was the two unidentified men she was seen with on campus. Well, even though there's some suspicious things which point at Zachary, I lean towards him being innocent here. That's not to say he wasn't a bad guy who did bad things to other people, but I'll refer back to Lewis Riggler's book and his experience working this case. Riggler was a highly respected Texas Ranger who investigated Zachary thoroughly, and he came to the conclusion that he likely wasn't involved. I can't overlook that, nor can I overlook how cooperative Zachary was with the investigation. 
He passed seven polygraph tests, allowed the authorities to search his cab, and let them check his body for bruises and scratches, yet they found nothing to incriminate him. So I'm leaning more towards the two men from the campus being the perpetrators. We do know that Virginia never checked into her dorm that night, so something had to happen to her after she was dropped off there. We have a witness who claimed that two perpetrators killed Virginia and buried her body just off campus, and while we can't be 100% certain this man's story is true, it does ring true. Or maybe, Virginia's killer was some unknown perpetrator we don't even know about. Sadly, I do not put much stock into the eyewitness sightings of her which took place after she went missing, nor do I believe that she got amnesia or was sold into white slavery. I really don't think Virginia lived past that night, and she was probably murdered shortly after she was last seen. I know that 70 years have passed and there isn't much chance of closure in this case, but hey, someone did come forward with a major tip 50 years after the fact, so there's always hope. So if by chance you happen to have any hard, verifiable information about what happened to Virginia Carpenter, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you just have your own personal theory about what happened, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. I want to offer up a big thank you to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and of course, another big shout out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. And like I mentioned earlier, we also have a donate button on our website, so if you're feeling generous and want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. So have yourself a good week, and join me next time for a brand new minisode of The Trail Went Cold. Thank <laughs> you.